Well, what if I told you, what if I told you that you could quit your job, become a successful full-time artist, making at least what you're making now, and even if you're in a high-end job making a lot of money, could replace that income? Would you believe me? I've seen it done. Today is a special broadcast of Art School Live dedicated to you and your art career. As many of you know, I teach art marketing at the plein air conventions and I have a book and I do a lot of stuff about marketing. I have the um, artmarketing.com blog. So get ready to take some notes because today we're going to be focusing on you and your career. But here's how it's going to work. You're going to post your questions. Uh, if you have a camera and you want to come on live, you can ask your questions. That way we can interact and solve your problems. And so if you have a burning question, a problem, don't know where to start, have a particular um, thing that you're trying to solve, just need some art marketing advice or business advice, today's your day. So here's how it works. Uh, because I'm going to repurpose this recording as an Art Marketing Minute podcast, uh, I'm going to start it out and tell you that we're going to welcome to the Art Marketing Podcast, et cetera, et cetera. So if that confuses you, that's what's going on. So we have a lot of people watching live already, and I see people from all over the country, so say hello. Happy Friday to everybody. We're, um, we, we needed to shake things up a little bit. We've been here uh, since the beginning of COVID, and in the beginning, I started doing art marketing lessons, and then we went to Art School Live, where we're teaching art every day. But a part of art for many of you is really learning how to make something out of it. You know, a lot of us have stacks and stacks and stacks of paintings or sculptures, maybe not stacks and sculptures, but shelves of sculptures that we've done that needs to be uh, found a home. And in some cases, it just needs a home. Some cases you want to make some money on it. Uh, there are people out there who would like to learn about marketing, not for the purpose of making money, but for other purposes, like for purpose of distributing their work or charity or other such things. So we're going to touch on anything and everything. So uh, let's get started. And uh, we're going to start by playing the Art Marketing Podcast opening. Let's do this that. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art. Proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. Welcome to the Art Marketing Minute. I'm Eric Rhodes, and today is a special Q&A. We have people who are going to be coming in and asking their questions, and so uh, we would love for you to submit your questions at any time. So come on in. Now, why am I qualified to teach art business or art marketing to you? Well, maybe I'm not. I don't know, but let's hope I am. Anyway, I've launched and built several brands, products, businesses over several decades, and I used to know nothing about marketing. As a matter of fact, I remember very clearly when I first started, I didn't even know how to make an ad. And back in those days, they didn't even have Macintoshes, right? So it was really crazy. Uh, I had to learn by trial and error. I wasted more money than I made in the beginning. And then once I figured it out, uh, marketing was the trigger that made all the difference. Because if you learn how to market, it makes a difference. Now, I have coached artists uh, out of bankruptcy or near bankruptcy uh, into living their dreams, making more money than they ever dreamed possible, living their dream of travel, living their dream of being in art galleries. And um, there's a lot of different ways that you can accomplish your goals. And we're going to talk about the different ways. But one thing to understand is that marketing isn't evil. Uh, you hear this a lot. I would never be so crass as to market my artwork. Well, if you have artwork for sale, if you, um, you sell your artwork, you're a small business. Whether you like it or not, you are a small business, maybe a big business. And all businesses fail based on marketing. You have to get customers. If you advertise in the yellow pages, you're marketing. If you, uh, if you have business cards, you're marketing. If you call people and ask them to buy something, you're marketing. All of that is marketing. That's sales. It's marketing, but it all kind of intertwines. So marketing does not need to be evil or slippery or dishonest or hypey. Uh, you have to find the voice that fits you 
And you're going to have to experiment with that voice until you get it right. But if you think um, marketing is just about having a great social media account or great Instagram account or something, you're wrong. It's not enough. And uh, having that, that's kind of like saying, uh, well, I know how to make eggs really well, but you can't just eat eggs all the time. You need to get a, uh, a variety of things that you know how to eat and know how to make so that you're, you know, if you're cooking, marketing is really the same thing. You're, you're going to be facing a lot of different challenges, a lot of different things, and you need to understand a lot of those things to be able to do it. Um, a, a friend of mine had all of his eggs in one basket and it was going really well and he was selling uh, literally billions, billions of dollars. And all of a sudden something changed. There was a law that changed and all of a sudden his business dried up overnight. And I remember him saying, I wish I had had like five or six different tracks going at one time. And now he talks about that all the time is you have to have five or six or 10 or 20 different tracks. You have to have different ways of attracting people. So imagine this, imagine that you have all of your eggs tied up into Instagram or Facebook. And uh, this happened to one of the artists that I produce videos for. Um, this artist had close to a million followers and all of a sudden uh, Facebook or Instagram, I'm not sure which one, pulled his account just pulled it. He never got it back. And all and, and all of a sudden he had to start from scratch. And so you don't want to have everything in a position where, you know, you you are vulnerable. You want to never be vulnerable. You want to have things out. So let's see if we have any questions in the comments right now. And if anybody wants to be the first one, you know, the first one is always the hardest to get, but let's see if we've got anybody. Also, I should tell you that if you're in the comments, we have posted a link and if you have a camera, you want to come on with that link, uh, go ahead and, and hit that link and, and come on and we will, we will do yours now. So let's see if we have some questions. I see one. Uh, the question is. Eric, uh, you, have one, you have one on screen. Oh, good. There it is. Thank you. <laughs> That's how I saw it. Okay. From Suzanne Silverston. Uh, which social media platform is best right now to focus on to market to a professional artist who would like to go national and international. Suzanne, why don't you come on screen? Because I want to probe that question a little bit more because I don't really understand it. And it would be much easier if you just come on screen and, and we could answer that question. So let's, let's try to do that. That makes it much more interactive. All right. So while Suzanne is, is clicking on the link, let's see if we have another question. Here's uh, one. How can we use AI to help sell our own work? Well, let's talk about AI. AI is a phenomenon. It's a revolution. And uh, I've seen people say that AI is going to be as an important of a revolution as electricity was or as the internet was. That's how important it is. Now, uh, the good news, bad news scenario is that AI is really designed to save you time and save you money. I've had... Um, People tell me that they're having discussions about eliminating some of their employees because they don't need those employees. Certain types of things can be done by AI and done very effectively. Um, so how can you use it in your art business? Well, let me give you an example of how I used it just the other day. I wanted to start creating some quotes for my social media account, and I wanted it to pull quotes from uh, my Sunday Coffee blog and uh, also from the art marketing uh, podcast and so on. So what I did is I gave it instructions and I said, go to this website, visit this website and pull 50 quotes uh, and put them in this format so that they were quoted and there were quote marks and my name was at the end of them. And then uh, within two minutes, I had 50 quotes. So I said, go ahead and pull 365 of them. So I would have a full year's worth. It did. I read through them. Most of them were good. Not all of them were good. Uh, so I pulled out the bad ones and then I exported that. There's another AI program that you can use in a program called Canva, which is a layout and design program. And so I sent these off to my designer. She exported them into Canva. And two minutes later, she had 
uh, a year's worth laid out. And then she used AI to put them into a scheduling program. And that scheduling program puts them in there so that those quotes just, there's a new one pretty much every day on, on one of my accounts. I'm not sure which account it is. So that's a, a really great example because AI is a time saver. Now, a lot of you might be concerned about AI and the fact that um, AI creates some pretty amazing images and even paintings. And I've played with it and I've even used some AI on some ads that I've created. For instance, for Watercolor Live, I said, I'd like to have a, uh, a, a woman staring out a window at a watercolor world painted in watercolor. And it gave me a, a beautiful little painting and I used it in some ads. I've also done some where it looked really wonky and you could tell it was AI, but that's changing pretty fast. You're going to be able to use AI. As a matter of fact, one of the problems we're going to have is distinguishing between uh, live and fake. You'll you'll be able, somebody will be able to take my voice, my likeness. This is what part of the Hollywood strike was about, is they could take my voice, my likeness, and uh, have it write and create special broadcasts of me and put it out there. Uh, and I could do that in theory. Now, I don't think it's quite ready for that yet, but there are some pretty amazing things happening that, that it can be done. So right now it's about time saving. Now, if you're a professional illustrator, it's going to make it tough for a, because of AI, because you can go in and get some illustrations that, that are, um, you know, that are beautiful and I've done it. So that's where it's going to be a problem. Is it going to replace artists? Well, I know a guy who has, has put, um, he has a gallery online. He has uh, created some images in AI and he prints them out and sells them and they sell very well. So that's an option for somebody. It doesn't mean that's going to put you out of business. It's going to be something that somebody wants. Now, uh, there's also some lawsuits that are taking place. For instance, there's some uh, celebrities uh, who, you know, you could you can go into AI and say, hey, give me something in the style of, you know, Richard Schmidt. And then it would copy a Richard Schmidt type of thing. Well, you know, there's going to be people who are going to battle that. Uh, and whether or not they're going to win, I don't know where, what the outcome is going to be. But the idea for AI is time saving. You know, you can, if you have a lot of, dare I say, menial tasks that you have to do on a day by day basis that can be done in two minutes with an AI program like ChatGPT or others. And by the way, the key to ChatGPT is use version four. Um, you know, you have to pay for that, but, uh, it's, it's amazing. And, and, uh, it is going to change everything and, uh, it's, it will change the world, but you know what? It's not going to be a bad thing. Um, everybody said when desktop publishing came out, uh, when the Mac first came out and the first laser printer came out, everybody said, this is going to change the world. This is gonna, you know, um, you know, it's going to get rid of certain jobs. And it did, you know, there's no longer, there was no longer paste up and waxing of type. And there were, you know, designers had to cut things out and place them. All that stuff went away with the Mac. And I embraced it very early on and did newsletters. And that's what got me into the publishing business early on. And, you know, it did hurt a lot of people who were graphic designers at the time. Uh, but they had to keep up and change. And so that's just how it worked. So anyway, that's the question on AI. Okay, let's get Suzanne back now. Suzanne, uh, ask me again and help me understand what, what I'm missing. Well, I, I uh, you know, I watch you live on Art School Live uh, regularly and a lot of the programs also. I've been uh, a lot of the uh, streamlined programs that are online as well as in person. And uh, I hear different things from different artists about um, which way, which, which platforms are uh, most important right now. Things change over the years. Um, so I, I know I'm working right now on an up-to-date, uh, updating my website, inventorying all my art, narrowing it down to um, what I think is the better pieces and what, what I should market out there. Um, before this, I've been more of a, a sell locally and a hobbyist in um, Houston, Texas area. But now I've moved to Florida. I'm trying something different. And I'm trying to do that right website and 
be sure that I have my work protected, all that. So I'm okay. wondering, uh, where, what's the status right now? Instagram is well, so have limitations now. Um, I've only I'm only active on Facebook. Well, so let's, let's start Facebook. with where you need to start. Um, I met with an ad agency the other day who's who's been trying to get our business, and that you know they had some some very specific questions about who our audience is. And those questions determine what the platform is. The, the reality is that TikTok is really, really hot. Instagram is really, really hot. Facebook is still very, very strong. As it's, it's still huge. Um, there are platforms that, that some people use that you probably don't use. Um, you know, there's Reddit, there's um, uh, Snapchat, et cetera. And so what you have to first ask yourself is, is who is my customer? And, and, and the, the starting point for all marketing, it begins with, what do I want to accomplish? So it, it, if you say, okay, I've got a fresh start. I've just moved to Florida and I know where you are in Florida. Um, and so I think the, the starting point is, what do I want to accomplish? So let's just start there. What do you want to accomplish? Uh, uh, just I, I would just like enough income to do to enter into that uh, plein air uh, circuit and travel around. Okay. It's, it's a big so, thing about traveling. It's income for those kind of things. But I also have a lot of art that uh, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be. You know, don't want to keep, but. There's a lot of people that would like it. I think okay. would like it, but I just not reaching them. All right, let's start there. Okay, so just make up a number off the top of your head of how much money you need to fulfill that dream of being able to travel without eating into your savings. Uh, doing able to being able to go to things like All Color Week or Adirondacks or you know one of the art trips or the thing that are plein air events that you want to go to traveling to paint. Um, what does that number look like for you? $10,000, a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred million dollars. What's it look like for you? Well, it's on the millions, <laughs> unless you start offering expensive vacations, <laughs> the very expensive ones. Yeah, I, have uh, a new, I have a new one. It's only $1 million to attend. <laughs> I'm not out there to buy uh buy master's art somewhere, but anyway, so, but, but the, po the point is, it, it, we, and you don't have to answer the question, but let's yeah. just, let's say I'm gonna have that, to think about that one, <laughs> or, say harder. what I'm going to have to think about that one harder. All right. Well, that's something everybody needs to think about. The starting point in all marketing is what do I need? And then the second point is what do I want? Right. So the difference being is what I need. Let's say that you, you told me that you absolutely, to be able to continue to paint, you needed to be able to pay for your canvas and art supplies and, uh, you know, whatever that was. And let's say that that number was $5,000 a year. All right. So you, if you said that, that number then is my need is $5,000 a year. So that's the first thing we have to conquer is what's my need. The second thing we have to conquer is what's my want, right? Because you need to pay for your art supplies, but you want to be able to do your plein air travel, right? So let's say that that plein air travel is $10,000 a year just to make this easy. So now we have a nut of $15,000 we have to crack. So what I like to do, and, and this is really simple math stuff, but and I'm not a mathematician by any stretch, but what I like to do is I like to say, okay, Let's break this in, you know, eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So let's break this into um, $15,000. Let's just, for sake of discussion, let's say it's $12,000. Make the math easy. So I have to generate $1,000 a month to hit what it is I want. So when you break it down into that, it really makes it easy to understand because now you say, okay, I have to generate $1,000 a month. And let's say on average, I've got to generate um, 
$500 every other week, right? Or $250 a week. And when you know that, your mindset changes. Because if you hold yourself accountable and you say, all right, I have to get $250 in this week, you're putting yourself under a little bit of pressure. Because if you don't get 250 this week, then you got to get 500 next week. And if you don't get that, then you got to get the next, the next week and so on. And if you fall behind one month, then you got to get 2000 the next month, right? So if you have that discipline and say to, or I say to myself, okay, that 250 every single week, now, now what you got to do is you got to say, all right, uh, what do I have to do to get that 250? Now, does 250 seem like a lot of money to you or not a lot of money to you? Not a lot. Okay. So the first thing you could ask yourself is what strategy could I employ to get $250 a week as a base, right? So what are some ideas that you could get $250 as a week that would be a pretty easy thing to sell? I could probably return to teaching uh, uh, online again. Okay. Okay. All right. Do you want to do that? Do I want to do that? Uh, spe- uh, not. You don't not, want to do that. Do, well, yes. Yes, I do. I do. It's a way to get out there, but I don't want to do it. Uh, uh, I, I'd rather break it up like once a month rather than do it, uh, do it right. like weekly or whatever. Become a. See, I'm retired now, so getting yeah. back to a job is uh, like a full time job. Is uh, it's is not what not- you want to do. Well, I, I think another thing to do, Suzanne, is to make a list of what you don't want to do, okay. and 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 what you don't want to do is do online teaching every week. And yeah. so, is it practical to do something once a month? Maybe, but. There may be five other ideas or 10 other ideas. So one of the things you, you talked about, for instance, you said, I have a lot of, a lot of paintings that are just sitting around that, that they just need a home, right? And yes. maybe you have some paintings that are not worthy of your normal high price uh, that you could figure out a way that what could I do to sell one painting and make $250 every single week? Or what could I do to sell one painting and make $500 a week? And you'll find that if you, if you think of it that way, it'll simplify the process and it will help you realize that there's probably one little thing you could do. And, and the way I look at things is I don't want to do, I don't want to do it four times a month. Personally, I want to just nail it. Right. So if I need a thousand dollars for that month, what I want to do is say to myself in the first week of April, I'm, I have a strategy in that first week of April, I'm going to sell a thousand dollars worth of paintings that I keep thousand dollars net that I keep. And then I'm going to start focusing on my next month. And the reality is if you spend one or two days thinking about it, implementing it, and then nailing it, you'll, you'll sell a thousand dollars worth of paintings out of the box easily. And it might be something as simple as taking them down to a local diner. It might be as something as simple as taking them over to the manager's flea market for a day. You know, there's a lot of different things. Now, sometimes you have to spend money to make money if you want to get access to an audience, but um, those are things you have to account for you know, so if if obviously you have to spend money to go into a flea market or something, I'm not suggesting you do that. But if you have to spend that money for uh, fifty dollars extra for a booth, then you got to build build that in and up the price of your paintings. All right, so I'm going to move on to somebody else. I hope that's been helpful. All right, see you out there. Okay, next we have Ilya. Ilya, yeah, Ilya. Ilya, where are you? I'm I'm watching you from Germany actually right now. Ah, uh, Stadt in Deutschland. Yes, <laughs> thank you so much for taking me in. Yeah, I have a question about um, let's say running an art business beside having a full time job. I I am sure that a lot of emerging artists uh, struggle with this thing. Um, basically, just not having time. I I mean it's the case for me. Um, having to work forty hours a week. I have a family. I have a son. Uh, I need also this spend time with them so I can't like 
take all my weekends out just to, to do my art stuff, you know? Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, what do you do for a living? I'm a web developer, actually. And it's actually not the case that I hate my job and I want to quit and do full-time art. It, it's not the case for me. I, I know it's the case for some people, but not for me, at least at this point. Okay, um, so the strategy that I just talked about, the first the first thing is is go backwards and ask yourself those questions. Like how much money, how much money do I want to make? Is your goal to um is your goal to supplement your income? Uh, or is your goal to eventually quit your job? I wouldn't say this online one way or the other because you don't want to have that haunting you. But the idea would be is if if you said to yourself, okay, five years from today, I want to be a full-time artist. There's mm -hmm. a, a way to go about that. If if you say, really, all I want to do is bring in so many uh, euros uh, a, a month, then start with that, right? How much money do I want to bring in? And then work backwards on that. Again, how do I get there? You're come coming up with a strategy. Mm -hmm. what, what a lot of people fail to do is they forget that what they have to their benefit uh, already. Like, where do you already have relationships and where do you know a lot of people? First would be work, right? Your ar arbite. So uh, if, if you ask yourself, how could I appropriately, without making people uncomfortable, how could I sell my artwork to my coworkers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So what you could do is you could ask your boss permission and you could say, I'd like to do a, a, a showing of my art and I'd like to make it available, but I don't want to put anybody under any pressure. Uh, but I think it'd be neat to be able to take the conference room and just put some things out for a day and just say, hey, everybody, I'd love for you to look at my art because I'm very passionate about it. I don't expect you to buy anything. But if you want to, I did put a price on anything, but there's no pressure. Mm -hmm. right? That, because at work, you don't want anybody to feel pressured. Yeah, of course. And, of course. and right there, just doing that. Uh, one time you might generate in enough money to to you know get the extra money you need for for something and then you can do that once a year the other thing you could do i i know somebody who did this it was very effective is they went to the manager they lived in a big apartment complex mm -hmm. and they went to the manager of the, the apartment complex and they said um what i would like to do is uh, i'd like to do an art show in the recreation center and they loved the idea because they're always trying to get people to get the community together and get people mm -hmm. to know one another because the longer, the more connected you become, the longer you stay as a renter, right? Yeah. So uh, you could go to your uh, apartment complex or your neighborhood um, maybe has something or your local library, uh, things like that could, could start. I have a video you might want to watch. Uh, it's at painttube.tv mm -hmm. and it's called how to quit your job and become a successful full-time artist. And okay. it goes through the whole process because here's what you want to do. You're, you're here. This is, let's say that um, you're making, um, I, I, I'll just make up a number. Let's say you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. and, or a hundred thousand euros a year. Um, and in your art, you're not making very much. The goal is to get to the point where you're making as much with your art as you are with your, your income. Mm -hmm. And then the goal is to get your, your art to the point where you, if you decide, can say, all right, I want to go full time. But the key to that is you want to do it consistently for three to four months. Mm -hmm. get, uh, and, and if you can do it consistently for a year, then after a year, you can quit your job. Uh, and I'm not recommending you do, but um, you might be able to say, hey, I want to go to part time or I only want to work as a consultant or I want to do a little bit of it, keep my hand in it so that you have a backup. But the idea is d don't go cold turkey. I've seen people do that where they'll say, you know, I'm so sick of my job. I'm just going to quit my job yeah. and start my art career. The problem is when you start your art career, it goes very slowly. It goes like this. And, mm -hmm. and so what you want to do is uh, learn that while you're on somebody else's income, right? Get your art career launched, get your branding started, get your advertising started, and, and 
look at that and say, I already have an income. Some of that income can go towards funding, building my brand and getting myself known and getting the money in the door. Mm -hmm. And then as you get that to be more successful, then stabilize, see if you can reproduce that for another year. And then you can then say, okay, now I'm ready to phase myself out. That's great. Actually, great advice. Thank you so much. All right. What city are you in? Um, uh, it's called Ubertal, uh, near Uberstadt. Cologne, if you know. Uberstadt near Kern? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I don't know it, but I know Kern. So yeah, I have a very good friend in Cologne who is, uh, um, I don't know if he's still working, but he, he um, his name is Helmut Rodermacher. Okay. And he ran uh, the agency that did all the um, all the work for Audi ADHC. Audi AC. Nice. Oh, nice. Nice, 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 nice. Nice. All right. Well, we need to get you to the plein air convention. I would love to actually. I would really love to. Okay. Uh, hopefully soon. I'm trying to do more and more uh, of this. I'm looking like for communities and uh, just like-minded people to join. We don't okay. have a lot of pastel uh, artists here. This is my main medium. Yeah. So uh, this is a struggle here in Germany. There aren't many uh, pastels here yeah. apparently. So uh, um, I'll tell you what. If if you can come up with the money for a hotel room and a flight, I'll I'll comp you on the convention. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so and, much. And you contact me privately. And the reason I want to do that is because I'm doing a scholarship program for younger people because we want to make sure that we get more younger people into the plein air movement for the future. That's amazing. That's right? amazing. So um, Amadine will reach out to you privately. And if you want to take me up on that either this year or next year, you let me know. And I, and that'll be my gift to you. That would be great. Thank you so much. That's very You're generous. Well. I, right. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care. All right. We have another one. We have uh, Elaine Miller. Elaine, what's your question? Hi. So it's a trick question. <laughs> so <laughs> What do you think about um, marketing your paintings online as opposed to being in a brick and mortar gallery? Well, you're a gallery owner. Why do you ask that question? Because I hear people saying that they're thinking that brick and mortar is going to be passe, that it's all going to be online. And I know of one gallery that was a fabulous gallery in my area that closed. And he said, I don't have to be open anymore in a brick and mortar because I have my clients and I can go down to my kitchen table in my PJs and make sales online. And I thought about that for a while and I thought, hmm, he said other people will probably follow suit. Well, that's so been happening. That's been happening for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, there, there was a gallery in uh, in Dallas. Well, I'll tell you a couple of stories. I can't use names. No. Uh, there was a very prominent gallery in Dallas and their rent was, they were in a high end part of town. Uh, their rent was, I don't know, $50,000 a month. Yeah. And, you know, you have to sell a lot of artwork just to pay the rent, not to mention the employees and the bills and everything else. And they decided to do a hybrid of that. What they did is they rented a warehouse, they tricked out the warehouse, they put the gallery in a warehouse, but it was, they, they had the same attitude and that was, I have my customers, uh, mm -hmm. we have a relationship with our customers and uh, we will just bring them to the warehouse if they wanna see something in person, but we'll also sell it online. Um, that gallery did that, it succeeded wildly, and then it died. So why do you think it died? Um, because it's like a revolving door and all of their buyers had done their purchases and they had nobody coming in that knew them. That's exactly That's right. So there, there's a thing called attrition. And mm -hmm. in a normal year, let's say you have a list of 100 buyers. In a normal year, just any average year, 10% of those buyers will drop out and you'll never see them again. Uh, and, and they drop out for various reasons. They move, they get sick, they die. 
they lose interest. They're on to other things. Uh, they have they don't have any more wall space in their house. Uh, you know, I've heard all these things. I know you've heard these things too. Every year, ten percent of of and by the way, this is true for an artist. It's true for a gallery. So what I like to do when I do these presentations at the convention, I show an up escalator and a down escalator. And, and I want everybody to visualize that for a minute. You've got an up escalator. There's always new people coming up the escalator. There's always people coming down the escalator. In other words, there's always going to be people leaving you. And there's always going to be people that are coming to you. Now, they're not going to come to you unless you turn the escalator on. They're not going to climb the stairs. They're not going to go to that effort. So you have to, you have to find ways to seduce people into your business, your gallery, your as an artist or otherwise. But let's talk about that attrition a little bit further. In 2008, when the big recession hit, um, most galleries lost 90% of their customers and they never returned. These are customers that were flush with cash and then they had it all tied up in the stock market. The market died. They didn't have any backup. They, you know, they didn't have it anywhere else and they never recovered. I have friends that were that way. They had to sell their houses to survive, et cetera. So there are times uh, in, in, in any business's life where your attrition doubles you, you know in one month it might be 10 percent. some months you know something's going on like right now because the economy is so tough and 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 the cost of food is has gone up you know 30 or 40 percent uh the cost of eggs has gone up 60 percent um you know there are times when people are like whoa i can't be buying any art right now or whoa, I can't be spending money on something else right now. So during those times, your attrition rate increases and you can continue to market to those people. And you have to actually, when, when you see, uh, you have to always assume that 10% is going to drop off every month and you always need to have an active marketing effort. But when you see times when your business actually decreases you have to do something that's counterintuitive. You have to increase your marketing, right? So I had a conversation with my team uh, when this inflation stuff started happening because we started seeing some loss of business. And I said to the team, we, uh, the first reaction from the accounting department is, well, we have to cut all of our expenses. And I said, right, but we're not cutting our marketing expenses. They said, but we have, we spend, you know, a half a million dollars a year in marketing. I said, yeah, we're going to continue to spend, we're actually going to increase that. And they said, but we can't. And, and I said, if we don't, we won't have any income. We have to keep marketing to keep people coming in the door. And it was very effective and it worked. Uh, uh, the, uh, there was a period of time when we stopped some of that marketing. And what happens is marketing is about momentum. And what if you keep the momentum going, then it keeps growing. If you stop marketing, then you start doing this and then you go, Oh, I'm going to start up again. So now you're down here. You got to start up again. But if you, if you stop here and then you keep going, you keep going and you keep going. But if you stop here and you go down, now you're down. Now, when you realize you, you your marketing is, uh, you're not getting any customers. Now you have to start again. So you're losing your momentum. So I hope that I, I, I and and okay. So I'm going to get to your question. I'm sorry. So your question is about online marketing. Look, I I think that um, a lot of people are very successful with online marketing today. Uh, uh, there are artists who are selling only on Facebook, only on Instagram, only on TikTok. Uh, there are uh, galleries who are doing that. But the reality is, like I said earlier, you don't want to have all your eggs in a single basket because that basket can can change. There was uh, about three, two years ago, Apple changed something in their technology, which basically made uh, a lot of emails not get through anymore. And so people who were marketing exclusively by emails, all of a sudden their business dropped by at least half because Apple makes up about half of the phones. And so um, 
you know, those people had to figure out new ways to recover. But if you were like us and you had multiple other forms of marketing going on, you see the, the, the attitude now, and, and I can completely understand getting seduced by this attitude, especially if you're 30, right? If you're 30 or 40 and you're a digital native and you grew up and the only thing uh, that you know is digital, your assumption is that everything is digital. And I totally understand that and I get that. But I have a friend, he ran, um, I, I have to be careful how I say this, he works for one of the biggest ad agencies in the world. And he ran marketing for one of the biggest car companies in the world. That's about as far as I can say. And uh, he said to me one day, he was over for dinner and he said, you know, we uh, we're facing a really interesting challenge. He said, we know online marketing works, but it doesn't work as well as traditional marketing. And he said, but, all these dealers from these, this, this car dealers group now have turned their businesses over to their kids and they want to only do online marketing and we're doing it and we're doing it effectively, but we're not getting the same kind of sales. And so uh, they fired us as an agency and they went somewhere else. And then the new agency had the same problem and they fired them. They went somewhere else, et cetera. So the, the, the thing you have to understand is that People have lives and they have different ways of uh, um, being exposed to products, right? You're driving down the road in your little red Audi convertible <laughs> and you're seeing billboards, you're seeing signs. You go into a, a truck stop and you're going to see uh, you're, you're going to see marketing uh, on the products themselves. you you, open your email, you're going to see marketing, you, you know, it, marketing is a cumulative effect. It takes on average seven impressions for a person to buy something before they decide they're going to buy something. There are exceptions to this, of course. But uh, so if you have uh, seven impressions in a short period of time, now you might get some of those impressions on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or, or email or, uh, you know, at, an art show or otherwise, but it's all cumulative effect. And those effects really make the difference. And so what, uh, what I recommend to people is um, it's okay to have an online marketing strategy, but you really should have a little bit of online and a little bit of offline because you don't want to have all your eggs in that basket. And if you are doing online only, that's fine but don't stick to just Instagram. Don't stick to just Facebook. And also consider the fact that you could lose those in a minute. You know, the, the people in, in Washington, DC are absolutely insane. All of them. I'm not making a political statement. None of them. I don't like any of them. And, you know, they don't know what's going on and, and they get somebody who complains about something and they say all of a sudden, Oh, you can't run ads on Instagram anymore. Boom. It's over. Right. Uh, and stuff like that happened. That happened in the, um, uh, the, I can't remember what they called that. that you know, they used to run those inf oh, infomercials on TV. They, you know, people made billions with those and all of a sudden it was outlawed and all of a sudden it was gone. Mm -hmm. so, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. And yes, we're keeping our gallery going. We're told all the time there's nothing like seeing a real painting in person because you can't get all the colors and all the feel of this wonderful connection to a painting on a picture that's on. Well, online. that's very true. And and, yeah. and one of the things that Instagram has done is it's it's you know, you can't when you see a painting in person, it's a lot different. And so that's something we have to keep in mind. But also, you know, people, including people who are internet generation or digital generation, they take vacations, they go to uh, take a weekend in Portsmouth, New Hampshire and wander into Sears Gallery because they're looking for something to do. And they, they want to remember something from their vacation. And it's, you know, consider this. I mean, there are gift shops online, but then there are gift shops that sell things that, uh, you know, you want a t-shirt or you want a memory. We just got back from Japan and I, I bought a little hello kitty that, you know, with a moving arm. Uh, 
uh, for my and office. It's just to be, it's just a souvenir. <laughs> And so people want souvenirs and some people want, you know, $20,000 souvenirs and big paintings and some people, want, you know, want great memories. So um, anyway, I hope that answered your question. It did. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Okay. It looks like uh, Ella is back. Did you have another question or you just were still hanging there? Uh, I'm no, you didn't yeah, have another no, no, I was just hanging around. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. All right, that's good. Thanks, bye. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see how we get rid of you here. All right, let's see if we have any other questions. Amandine, uh, Cindy Beaumont says, can I explain branding? Oh, boy. So a brand, a brand is nothing more than um, a badge of trust. Um, it, it is having a clear picture in the head of someone about what you are, what you represent. So what is the brand? Well, the most successful brand in the world is McDonald's. So the brand of McDonald's represents something. What does it represent? It represents it's everywhere. It's fast. It's consumable. Um, you know, I can get in and out and get get some decent, consistent food. It's going to be consistent whether I'm in Tokyo or whether I'm in uh, uh, Dallas. So that's what a brand stands for. A brand can stand for a lot of things. A Louis Vuitton brand says um, we're expensive, we're super quality. And so brands need to be built and you have to decide where do I, what do I want my brand to be? And so are you going to be known as a discounter? There's an artist, again, no names, but there's an artist who used to go to a lot of plein air shows and this artist would lower his prices way below all the other artists and they would sell, everything would sell. So, you know, maybe it was $500 instead of $2,000. Everything would sell and none of the other artist stuff would sell. And all the artists would be mad because this guy became a discounter. But what happened is because he branded himself as a discounter, all the other shows said, you know what? We're not inviting this guy anymore because first off, we have to make money. First off, we have to make minimum amounts of sales. And secondly, is we don't want the brand of a discounter as part of our thing. Suddenly, this artist got uninvited hundreds of shows, or maybe not hundreds, dozens. So you have to be, you have to ask yourself, you know, what is my brand? What do I stand for? So how does a brand impact an artist? Let's talk about that. If if I'm an artist and um Let's say I walk into an art gallery. Let's say I walk into Elaine Miller's gallery, Sears Gallery in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And, and by the way, I have work in there. So you walk into a gallery and you, you fall in love with two paintings. You say, oh, I like that painting and I like that painting. And you're trying to decide which one you're going to buy. Do you know which one wins? The one that wins is the one with the brand, Right. So you walk into a gallery and you see a Scott Christensen painting and you see some artist that you don't know. And let's assume they're equally priced, but they probably wouldn't be because someone you don't know isn't going to have a higher price like that, typically. So you're going to say, okay, well, I'm going to go for the Scott Christensen because I know he's a big artist. I know he's famous. I know he's collectible. I, I know that if I ever decide to sell this, I'll be able to sell it again. And I know that everybody knows who he is. And as a result, I, you know, when they walk into my home, they're going to go, oh, you have a Scott Christensen painting. And that happened to me the other day. I went over to, to the home of a friend and she had a, a big Scott Christensen painting and a big Kwong Ho painting. And I'm like, wow, these are, these are really prominent artists. And so what that does it's the same effect as somebody walks into your house and they see a Bentley in front of your house. It's like, wow, you own a Bentley? Wow, maybe they don't say anything about it, but it, 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 the brand matters. Now, the reality is that a Bentley, um, 
uh, which I don't even know how much a Bentley is because I've never had the money to, to buy one. But uh, let's say a Bentley is um, $400,000. And let's say a 7 Series BMW is $150,000, $200,000. I don't know. The reality is the Bentley is built on the same chassis and a lot of things are the same, but it's the fine touches. If you spend your time building a brand, it matters because you'll get a higher price for your paintings. People will know who you are. And as a result, your brand will be in command. Remember that brand in command. I'm in command because I have a brand. I can tell you stories. Uh, One particular artist started advertising a lot in our magazine, Fine Art Connoisseur, and um, called me one day and said, hey, you know, I haven't sold a lot of paintings yet. I said, well, you're not, it's too soon. You know, you have to build up your, your awareness. But she said, all of a sudden, I'm getting invited to other art shows to be a featured artist. I said, yeah, the branding is kicking in. Uh, the people who are more tuned in, like the art show people, they're more tuned in. As the as it keeps going, the branding will kick in and the branding will start selling you over other things. So branding is what matters. Okay, so uh, we've we got time for one more question, Amadine, and then we're going to end this. Uh, how important are art competitions for success? Well, they're very important. And I think they're very important, and here's why. If you have an art competition, Let's say you're, uh, I, I happen to have an art competition, the Plein Air Salon, which, by the way, is not all Plein Air paintings. It's because Plein Air Magazine, so we call it Plein Air Salon. But, you know, we feature studio paintings, Plein Air paintings, even figure and portrait. So we have all of those categories as well. So if you enter a competition, it changes your head. It changes your mindset. The, and, and by the way, I've had this happen to me. I quietly entered under a dummy name, the uh, another competition, not my own. Uh, and I entered it because I wanted to see if I could win. I wanted to see if my work would stack up. Um, I, I, I didn't win, and that made me try harder for the next time. And, so, and, and I didn't keep entering, but, but you should have. I should have. Um, but the, the idea here is that you want to... You want to change your mindset from being, hey, I'm just some schmo who paints, not anything wrong with that, to I'm trying to build my career. I'm trying to build my brand. So here's what happens. If you start winning anything, and and by the way, it takes time to do this because your work is probably not up to par, even though you think it is. And by the way, every judge has something different that they they resonate with. And so you might have a judge that is, um, uh, you know, happens to love a certain type of impressionism. And you might have a judge that happens to like really tight work. So you might not win with every judge. And sometimes you can enter the same painting a second and third and fourth time. Kimball Geyser told me he entered the same paintings multiple times. And sometimes he won, sometimes he didn't win in our monthlies on the Plein Air Salon because different judges have different different tastes, right? But what happens is when you put yourself out there, you are elevating your mindset about competing and about marketing yourself. But the minute you start winning, if you get any acknowledgement, if you are acknowledged in, hey, I was in the top 25, and we send out something about that, You need to be putting that all over your Facebook. You need to put it in your resume. Chosen in the top 25 of the plein air salon for the month of June. If you win in any category, you know, hey, I won in the tree category. That's why it's important to enter multiple categories because if, you know, maybe you're not going to win in the plein air landscape category, but you might win in the uh, nocturne category or in some other category. And Because the key here is winning, having something to talk about. Because when you win, you have something to talk about. If you win in the monthly, then, of course, you get entered into the finalists for the year. And then you might have a chance of winning for the year. And if you win for the year, you're going to get all this publicity. Kimball Geyser, you know, we've we've had his picture all over everything with his big $15,000 check. And it was interesting. Here's another reason. I'm sitting there with Kimball Geyser. 
and I'm interviewing him on camera after he won at the plein air convention. And his phone rang and he said, I got to take this. And he picked up the phone and he went, uh huh, uh huh. Oh, thank you. Uh huh. Okay. Thank you. And I said, What was that? He said, That was so and so, a so and so gallery. And it was a prominent, very major gallery. He said, We've been watching you, but the fact that you won the plein air salon, we would like to invite you into the gallery. And, and he was blown away. I was blown away. And this is the kind of thing that when competitions say, you're good, you're great, you're sticking out, you need to be, uh, we need to pay attention to you. So uh, in the beginning, it's about getting your footing and telling yourself you're competing and investing in yourself and knowing, hey, I'm going to spend 30, 40, 50 bucks and consider that marketing. And I would, you know, if I could, I'd, I'd spend... Um, couple hundred bucks a month and I'd enter three paintings in, in three or four different competitions in every single one of them. And I do it every month, no matter what, because you're inevitably, you're going to win. You're going to make yourself better. You're going to push yourself. You're going to have something to talk about. And anytime you have something to talk about, it builds your resume. It's something to talk about on your website and, and it gives you credibility. And especially if you're somebody who is marketing through your social media you know, you want to be able to say, hey, I just uh, was named the number one nocturne painting for the month of June from the plein air salon. I mean, that's a big, big, big deal. Now, all of a sudden, people are going to look at you differently. They're going to pay attention differently. So anyway, I hope that helps a little bit about branding. So let me ask you guys this in the comments. Has this been helpful? Because um, I want to do this more. And I want to make sure that you guys are getting your questions answered. So go into the comments and tell us if it's been helpful. This has been the Art Marketing Minute podcast. I'm Eric Rhodes. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I just want to say one other thing. Uh, last year at the Plein Air Convention, I did not do Art Marketing Boot Camp. And the reason I didn't want to do it anymore is after 10 years of getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and spending uh, many, many days, uh, it takes about five days of preparation for every one hour of content. I just was burned out, quite frankly. But I'm bringing it back to the plein air convention this year, and we're going to be doing it at lunchtime. So we're going to do a lunch and learn. So anybody who wants to go grab their lunch and then bring it in, we'll do art marketing boot camp during lunch instead of in the mornings, uh, because nobody wants to get up at six o'clock in the morning for art marketing boot camp. So we're going to do that at least two days at the plein air convention. Now, I will tell you the plein air convention is very close to being sold out. It's in Cherokee, North Carolina, which is near Asheville. It's driving distance for a lot of people. And uh, it looks like it's the most successful convention we've ever done. When I last checked, there were about 40 seats left. And, uh, and I know that many seats have been selling every single day. We would love to have you. It's a great event. It's teaching on stage all day, every day for five days. Not actually not all day because we leave at a certain point. We all go painting together. We're going to be painting in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. We're going to be painting at some other areas around there. And on the last day, we're going to be painting at the Biltmore Estate outside in the gardens. It's going to be amazing to be able to see the building and paint the building. And we're going to all be there together. Uh, it's a really interesting phenomenon. So I hope that you'll come. There's still some seats left, but they will probably be taken down. will probably be sold out any minute now, uh, maybe today. So uh, it maybe may be are already. I don't know. I haven't checked. But uh, anyway, I hope this has been helpful. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back with Art School Live on Monday, and uh, we will see you every day at 12 noon, no matter what. I'm Eric Rhodes. Take care.